Hi guys! Shut it back! <laughs> Hello! And welcome back to a new episode on queer. Our very special guest today is Brent Price. So I've known Brent for about three years. Yeah, and he is such an awesome human being. He owns a beautiful gym in Vancouver called Hustle. So go check it out and show some love. In part one, Brent talks to us about growing up in a small, hyper-masculine, homophobic oil town in Canada and moving to a bigger city where he faces a bigger problem, which was substance abuse, and eventually coming to terms with his sexuality and breaking down all of those layers from his childhood. This is a jam-packed episode that you do not want to miss. If you haven't already, like, subscribe, and comment, and don't forget to hit that bell notification. Red Deer, correct? Yes, good old Red Deer, Alberta. Yeah, Red Deer is a small town in Canada, and it's yeah. kind of like one of the main oil towns. Um, yeah, it's like the kind of it's in between two major cities, and it's a little town that kind of connects them. So there's a lot of like the oil hub that happens yeah. in that little town. When I lived there when I was a little kid, I was there's like 35, 40,000. Wow. Yeah, it was really little. What was that like growing up in such a small town and such a like a I would say hyper masculine, hyper hetero. Very, very town. much. Yeah. In Canada? Yeah, you know, it was interesting because as a kid, I didn't really identify as gay. I didn't really understand that I was gay until much later in life. I didn't even come out until I was in my like late twenties. I never had any exposure to gay culture. Yeah. I never had any real I didn't meet the first gay person I met is when I traveled out overseas. Wow. Yeah. So it was like it was a very sheltered life. So it led to a lot of kind of confusion about what was happening yeah. with me later on because yeah. I really was like I don't understand what's going on wow yeah and like my brother was like super masculine like hear me roar I play football I get the girls I like <laughs> I work on the oil field and I am a man and my dad is like grew up in small town New Brunswick he was a commercial fisherman and then he was in the military and then he was a guard at a penitentiary so he and then he owned a construction company so he was like man 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. and I mean not that and unfortunately, they were products of their environment as well. So they threw out the word faggots and queer as in like derogatory terms all the time. And them saying that, did that ever make you feel anxious? No, or I feel like what happened is it just pushed it so far down yeah. that like, and I also was taught that like people who were gay had something wrong with them. They were like either mentally un. un like, well, they've been abused, they're, they had no masculine kind of influence in their life. And I had it all. My parents are happily married. Like, yeah. my dad was a great dad. My brother was, like, a great brother. Like, I didn't have any trauma that would, that is what I was told made you gay. Okay. So I was like, well, I can't be, I mean, I can't be gay. Yeah. And I was never the type of person that was like, oh, gays are bad. Like, I was never homophobic, yeah. per se, but I just never allowed it to, like, even come into my mindset that that could that be. was a possibility yeah mm -hmm. i was like i'll never be mean to anybody because i was just a nice kid i was extremely overweight so for me i had to be nice to everybody to have any friends because i felt so like terrible about who i was as a physical person yeah so i was never a mean kid so i would never be homophobic or say that kind of stuff just because it wasn't in me so did you get bullied quite a bit Luckily, my brother is a psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, brother. <laughs> Hi, Tom. <laughs> so he kind of paved the way because if anybody ever bugged me or anybody ever like made fun of me for being really overweight, he would be the first one to show up and Just make sure that never happened again. Really? Yeah. It scared me because I always, I always was thinking like, if Tom gets in trouble, he's going to go to jail. And then like, I never, so I would, even if when I got bullied, if anybody did do anything, I would not ever tell my brother because I, I knew what he would do and I was so afraid yeah. that if he did anything he would go to jail it'd be my fault yeah. so like I never told him anything I never told wow. him all that kind of stuff but just from other people knowing who he was it's still just like it definitely sheltered me from a lot of bullying exactly. that would have happened because I was like 
bad acne, really overweight, socially awkward, just like not, I was not cool. Just not know how I was just, yeah, I was not cool <laughs> at all. In, in school, did they ever talk about like LGBTQ? No. There was no it was a Catholic school. Wow. Growing up in Catholic school was again hard because you learn that you don't have a place no. as in the Catholic world if you're gay. 100%. So again, another reason why I got squished down into not being possible to me. Yeah. Did you get out of there? Oh, well, when did you get out of there? I mean, like obviously when, you're out of there. When did I, when did I <laughs> when get did out of there? When did you leave? Yeah, when did you leave? Right? As soon as I graduated, I was like, I gotta go. Yeah. I just gotta get out of here. I was having like a mental breakdown. Like really? something is not right. Things are just not aligning. The universe is not cool with what I'm doing. So I walked into a travel agency and this, I was like, what are people my age doing? And the travel agent was like, well, here's a book on Europe and here's a book on Australia. And then I went to Australia and I was like, boat, beach, party, party, done. done. How do I get I mean, there? Yeah. And when can I go? And I booked a one-way ticket that left three weeks later. Wow. And I was gone for a year and a half. Wow. That's when I built myself as a person. Wow. Because up until then, I'd always been like a shadow of my brother. Like, yeah. oh, you're Tom's brother. Yeah. So that's kind of like when I separated myself from there, I was like, wow, I'm actually kind of like a nice person. Like I yeah. actually started to build confidence as to like who I was as an individual mm -hmm. and then wow. went home and I was just like, yep, Alberta is not for me. Yeah, and not my, my friend Katie, uh, she's like, I'm going to Vancouver. You should come. And I was like, what am I going to do in Vancouver? She's like, what the fuck are you doing here? I was like, Good point. I'm there. I'll come. <laughs> I'm I'm <in>. yeah. <laughs> and so we moved here. You moved to Vancouver. What was that like moving from such a small town to a big city? And you said you found yourself, but how was that move? It was freeing because I very much like needed my own space to grow into the person I am today. 100%. And I couldn't do that around my family. Mm -hmm. um, because I, even at that time, even after traveling all through Southeast Asia and all that kind of stuff, I still was very much in the closet. I had started to come around to the thought, and I was still really overweight. Like, did you go through any depressing times? Whether that is oh, yeah. like high school, like living in Red Deer, being so closeted, or in Vancouver, where you? Yeah, I feel like because I was so sheltered in Red Deer, I never, I never really hit a depression there. Mm -hmm. It was definitely when I was here that okay. I started like. When things started to make sense, then right, like feeling a little bit, yeah, like I was like, okay, none of the relationships with girls I've ever had has ever worked out, and not because they're not awesome, because they've all been rad, but because I'm not awesome to myself right now. And then so I started like getting into drugs and get, drinking obscene amounts. Like wow. I was drinking, like I drink a two six of Jameson two or three times a week. And wow. yeah by myself sometimes mostly with friends because i was always like it's okay because i'm doing it with friends yeah. it's not i'm not an alcoholic yeah because i'm doing it with friends but i would literally have my friends weeks planned out so i know oh well, like i know this person's off on tuesday night so i can so party I with grab them. them yeah i know this person's off on a friday so i can go party with them and i was like always looking for the next person to party with and did you feel like that validated you uh to be desired by people it allowed me to be so busy that i didn't have time to talk or to really like absorb what was going on in my in mind time. and that's when i really hit like a pretty heavy depression where i was just like oh yeah i usually battled it with traveling i was like oh i'm not feeling good i'll just go travel again and wow. then i'd go travel and see the world and have a good time and then i'd come back and i hit it again it would just be the same cycle over and over again how long were you addicted for? Probably about three years. Three years. Mostly alcohol for three years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then I got... And it was constant. There was no break. There was just like... No. Bang, 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 bang. Party, party, party. And I worked at a, I worked at a company that was very party motivated. So like everybody loved to drink together. Your team drank together. Every month we had a like an event that celebrated yeah. top sales. And it was all open bar. And then yeah. we got open bar Christmas parties and open bar... Like annual parties. It was just like, it was a hard drinking culture. Wow. So it was an enabling culture. It wasn't their fault. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't ever blame it on them because it was me that was putting it in my body, but it was definitely an, an enabling culture. And so finally, when it all kind of really came to the biggest hit was when I went to Europe. I had a really crazy mushroom trip. And that's where all, that's where everything that's Everything where changed. Hit. That's where honey <laughs> hit his gold yeah. mine. Yeah, exactly. That's when the, the, my world and my walls Change. came crumbling down because in that mushroom trip, it was like this like big emotional like breakthrough that it, it didn't actually. I, I didn't actually see the fact that I was gay 
But I saw the fact that, because I was like wondering, why am I never in a relationship that's working? What is wrong with me? Like, I can't make it work. And so it just like yeah. hit me. I was like, you're looking in the wrong places. And when the people, when, when the right people like are right in front of you, you're so closed that you're not even seeing it. Wow. You're so guarded, you don't even let it in. So you never even had like an inkling that you were attracted to a certain person? I or... would always be okay with being attracted to a guy, but I would never allow myself to think that that's a life I wanted to live. Like I was like, but I'm, I'm cool with girls, so I'll just mm. stay with girls. Like I don't even need that. I don't need it. It's like, okay, that guy's good looking. I can see why girls think he's good looking. Yeah. But I would never think like I want to have a relationship with him because that's not the life that I wanted. And there's nothing, I, I'm not that like wrong person who has had trauma or has had these things that told me that I was gay I was for sure telling myself yeah. all these lies to to keep myself closeted but like so looking back I knew but I didn't let myself believe that I knew and I I get that I completely get that yeah. I, I suppressed my sexuality for a long time and I just hit it and I did yeah. so many girls and I was fine with that too until breaking point. Yeah. <laughs> um, breaking points. <laughs> breaking points. <laughs> but do you think we that, that was all to do with your past of like where you grew up and just how homophobic they were that yes. really made you suppress it? Yeah. And I think the cat like growing up in a Catholic school did it. I think growing up in a very very heteronormative family did it. The actually only one story of any family members ever being gay was my auntie Jerry's son was gay and they basically disowned him he moved to vancouver and because he was disowned by his family of course he turned to drugs and sex and he contracted hiv and died and that's the his that was the only oh, I see. family member that i've ever had yeah. that has been out to their family and then that's their view on what gay and now that's all are. they think that they do yeah. that gay people do is they move to vancouver they have lots of yeah. sex they get diseases and they die you know and that's like that was pushed on me so hard well i mean Holy as God. soon as i got through the depression that came soon after coming out yeah it was like fuck all y'all because like i i was really wasted angry so much time yeah. i was so angry i was mm -hmm. like i wasted so much of my life and so much of the experiences that i could have had because for in fear of what you guys would think mm -hmm. and in fear and also just from like the, the the situational suppressing my sexuality for so long that should never have happened. 100%. Never. 100%. And so I was angry. So I was like, you know what? If if you don't like it, you can fuck right off. Can and so know? every time I walked into a room, I'd make sure that I was holding Chris's hand. Anytime I wanted to, I would make sure I'd kiss them. Kiss him right in front of all of them. Get it. And make them uncomfortable. Make Good. them see that I'm still the person that they've always known. I'm still a nice person. And I'm still like, I'm still the, the person that they know from when I was a kid. I'm still the Brent. Yeah. yeah. I'm still the same Brent that they've always known. And push their but, boundaries. And now they re have they have no choice but to realize that sexuality changes nothing. Did you hear that? <laughs> Did you hear that? One more time. Sexuality changes nothing. Amen. Um, <laughs> all right. We're gonna get juicy now. Let's hear okay. the Europe trip. Europe trip. Oh god. Okay, so I went to Europe for I think I was there for like five or six months. Um, and traveling by myself again, and I got to Granada, Spain, mm. and there's a little area called the Albacine, which is like super like Mediterranean, almost like lots of, um, like lots of Arabic food and really cool vibes. Yeah. So I walked into a bar and I sat down and I was just chatting with the bartender. There was this wicked flamenco, um, dancer happening and yeah. like just, just feeling it, huh? right? Yeah. Having drinks and then... The, yeah, the the door opened, locked eyes with a guy, and that mushroom trip that I was on oh, hit around. me, and it was like, you're looking in the wrong places, and you're closed when it hits you, and I was like, oh my god, and I was like, because I immediately felt like, it wasn't just like, oh, he's attractive, I was like, he is sexually attractive. Wow, so that was your first sexual attraction. Yeah, to a guy that I was like, <sighs> I definitely am into it and yeah. he sat down that right next to me and we started talking and it was like he he absolutely knew that i was gay because he said do you have a boyfriend wow he didn't even say do you have a girlfriend he was like do you have a boyfriend and i was like no and no one has yeah talked. You're like, no, yeah no one's me. ever just like asked that yeah to me before and then 
but I wasn't intimidated. I wasn't yeah. mad about it. I wasn't yeah. scared about answering questions on it. I was like fully open, open book. We drank and danced and had a great time, walked down the street holding hands. Wow. And then we went back to his place and the rest is history, my friend. <laughs> wow. It was, it was wild. And then the next day is when I had the biggest breakdown of my life. Were you still, were you still big? Yes. And were you nervous? Of, like, did that ever cross your mind or that? Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Being a bigger person is never off your mind. Yeah. Yeah. There was a major battle happening in my head that whole night. Mm -hmm. Like, did I want it to happen? Yes. And like, did I, was I into it? Yes. But like, there was so much like tearing me back and pushing me forward. And like, there was inner turmoil that I had never felt before. It was like my, around, yeah. my walls were crashing around, around me. And I was like, just holding on for dear life. Like everything is just bubbling, exploding. Yeah, and you're just like, like <laughs> things, I, like things I need to know about myself were happening and I'm learning and I'm like scared and I'm excited. And I'm like, yeah. all these things were going on at the same time. And it was like, it was truly like a, a awakening moment for, wow. for me. And then after that, it was like, I didn't hug, kiss, sleep with anybody for a year. When you woke up the next morning, how did you feel? Horrible. Terrified. It was probably the most trauma that I dealt with in one moment ever, even to this day. Yeah. It was just like, I had so much to digest. So many layers. There's so many layers. And like the feelings that I was still feeling and the fear and like the, the real like I felt myself wanting to just push it down and never ever ever let that come to the surface again and I felt it trying to happen but at the same time I like overall I knew that this was your reality this was it and I had to I had to come to terms with it like I, I had to realize and actually live with it and learn it and navigate the new world as a gay man from that moment forward you just feel disgusted by yourself? Yeah, I was like, I am not that person. I am not a pervert. I am not faggot. I'm not all these things. All and I was like, from the, all these like words that were just always associated with, with being queer mm -hmm. were coming out as like, I'm not that, mm -hmm. but I am that. I think it's so important for people to understand how much words can affect oh an individual. God. Vocabulary is everything. Mm -hmm. Like once, once you like say start just naming something that's like negative as a general like yeah uh, like baggage are gross like that is just horrific to do to someone especially as when you have a kid yeah. like i know that my dad looks back now and is like oh my god what did i do so i know it wasn't out of malice but it definitely affected, affected everything i thought about myself mm -hmm. yeah Ooh, honey. yeah I know you didn't come out to your friend until 10 months later. Yeah. What was that in between phase like? What were you going through? Oh, I was through? just, Why I was just hide it? closed. I was like, I'm not, I just, I couldn't even come to terms with myself. I was still digesting it and like figuring it out and sitting thinking like, am I actually gay? Am I bi? Like what's going on? Within that 10 months is also that time where I was like, got really into prescription drugs. Was taking like all sorts of terrible things and just like not being a person who was aware anymore. I just numbed everything to try to like just push it away. And did no one know that anything was up with you? Did anybody talk to I you? I feel like, tried well, you? no, not really. Cause I was still functional. I still like showed up. Yeah. I still did my job. I still was like, and I think people just thought it was like a post travel depression, mm -hmm. which kind of happens sometimes. So I had to come to terms with it. I need to like, I feel I, I like to think of myself as a pretty resilient person. Yeah. So like, I, I honor myself. Yeah. I can feel, okay. Like you've, you've done your wallowing. You've done, you've done what it takes. You've, you've numbed yourself enough, like yeah. time to stand up and actually face what your life is going to be like. And then the first person I told him was my friend Katie. And I was like, this is what happened. And she's like, oh, cool. I was like, that's it. My that's heart. all. Like I'm. <laughs> I am about to like have a complete and utter breakdown over what I did. <laughs> and your responsible was like, oh, that's it. She's like, I thought you were going to tell me that you were like sick or something. Like, and that just made me realize like, why am I being so mean to myself? Yeah. Why am I just like tearing yeah. myself apart over this? Then finally I was just like, I don't owe anybody a coming out story. Amen. You know, like I was just Amen. like, I am just going to start to live the life that I want to live. And if people have questions, they can ask me.
I love that. So I started just dating guys and having a good time and being being completely myself. And I felt I like I that. opened up and my friends would be like, you're dating a guy? I'd be like, yeah. I'm like, why didn't you tell me you were gay? And I was like, do I have to? Why do I have to tell you I'm gay? <laughs> I thought dating a guy would give you a hint. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you know, I, you I, I, I told stop. you. <laughs> I can't, because I feel like, I don't know, it, it, the whole idea of having to continually come out and come out and come out and come out made me feel like I was doing something wrong. Yeah. Whereas like... I completely get that. You know, I just, I wanted to stop feeling like I was doing anything wrong. I felt like that for long enough. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to feel like I was living a life that I was going to live forever. And I'm never going to come out to anybody. Yeah again sobriety for mm-hmm. you what what was that like because you've had like three years of pretty ad, like yeah straightforward drinking, um, drinking alcoholism or using drugs you know what mm-hmm. was that what was that period of life yeah i was <laughs> the, the the last time i did prescription drugs this is such a funny story i literally locked myself in a room for days and just did a whole bunch of like pills and <laughs> watched planet earth and the very last episode of planet earth is with like the polar bears and it was like you know we're damaging everything but it's not too late like you can still we can all come together and we can make these changes and we can all still save the environment and be better people and i was just like yeah and that was literally snapped me out of it i got up and i like was that in your within that ten months? Yeah, and I never. That was did, your breaking point. That was my breaking point. Where I was like, I'm never doing that again. Wow. Yep. So I did a year sober, and it was at that time it was really freeing because it's like waking up on a Saturday without a hangover and going getting up, and that was also the time like I had already come out of the closet, so I'd already started to lose weight, and I was like, wow, now I'm even being more productive, and I'm feeling like so much better about myself, and then like mentally I was getting stronger, physically I was getting stronger, and I just felt like this is a really cool path to being the best version of myself Yeah, is through sobriety. Yeah. And the, and that was literally the last time where I have ever had like a major issue with drugs or alcohol wow. was before that. Ever since then, I've had a really good kind of understanding of who I am. Wow. And like, I've been able to be like, no, yeah. Like, like, were there any big realizations that came from being sober? Yeah. Like I had to really give my family more credit. Like, I just, I thought for sure that when they knew they were going to hate me and I was going to lose that side because I just like built up these walls around them being like, they're, they're homophobic. They're not going to love me. And so like coming out to them was another, it was kind of almost like a big fuck you at the same time as being like super scared. So yeah. you came out to your parents in Red Deer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, someone's gonna have to tune back in next week to hear the rest of that story. Now, in part two, Brent talks to us about coming out to his small town family, his battle with weight and how he links that to his sexuality and some of the biggest struggles that he had to overcome and the lessons he's learned from them. So yeah, continue to wait one week away. Put that on your countdown and I'll see you next week. Ciao for now.